Okay. Hello everyone. Uh, this is for Photosystem Detox. So if you're not in Photosystem Detox, uh, you might be in the wrong room. So uh, please, uh, may I have a warm greeting for Mr. Rad Perkin. Uh, 
you cannot give dynamic commands like uh, up this interface or uh, shut down this interface. But um, there's automatic logic, right? Like when automatically does something with interface popping up and going away, was apparently convincing enough um, for these distributions to adopt it in that in the target, which I find, find pretty amazing. We are working on actually adding this uh, interactive interface as well, so that we can actually do full that in the Or the ES opt down scripts of the virus. Um, another success we have is Antspawn. I'm not sure if you know um, Antspawn. Antspawn is a component of Systemy. It's something like a, a minimal container manager. And it's not so, like, I mean, it sounds a lot like it was something like Docker, but it's really not. Um, like, Docker focuses on microservices, like, where basically each container has, has a, 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 it's exactly one service. Um, with Zspawn, <coughs> it's really on a, uh, uh, running containers where every single container has its own operating system inside of it. Where operating system inside of it, it is not the <coughs> PMC, but actually the PLE1 that is actually two thirds of the main PLE1, uh, for example, system B. Um, uh, this is actually being used uh, nowadays as, as backend for core OS rockets, which is kind of cool, um, given like Enspot or something we primarily created um, to actually test system B for ourselves. Right? Because if you if you have system D um, and you want to um, test the boot up, you can, of course, always do a hard boot up with your physical hardware. And then you waste a lot of time because you always watch the screen while the virus runs through and these kind of things. So um, we started, um, uh, while developing system D, doing this stuff with virtualization, KVM, and things like that. And that's what, much better, but uh, you, it's still very hard to debug because you can actually not touch a debugger that easily to, to um, the inner process of the virtual machine unless the debugger also runs on the virtual machine. So um, we created that spawn for that purpose, which is like a minimal container manager that allows us to, it's like a cherub and steroids, right? Um, um, a cherub and steroids where it's actually capable of running a full operating system inside. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's similar to Docker, but it's certainly not like Docker. Um, and it's part of the basic operating system and how we test our stuff, how we build our stuff. And it's basically building a whole range of other products like all that stuff. Uh, what's also interesting is that some of the more auxiliary components of system D, like uh, um, for an angular D, we decided that, well, um, we didn't want to just glue something together out of existing components um, that match or don't match uh, somewhat closely together. We saw that we do it properly, right? And so um, for an angular D, we created this uh, little small library, which does DHCP. DHCP, um, of course, is, a, is actually a very tricky protocol. It's basically, you have five messages where you say, I want an IP address, um, that somebody says, I can offer you this IP address, and somebody says, I want this IP address, and then you get it, you have the IP address now, and then there's one to, to uh, do it up again. So, um, it's really, as long as the most trivial protocols um, there is, and we decided, okay, we don't want to script everything together, but the HTTP, I'm um, afraid of Larry called SVD HTTP. Um, it's not really public, but it's supposed to be public one day, um, and it's what network is based on. Um, so after we did that, then the number of manager people saw, okay, and it's kind of cool that they're just trying to get DHCP libraries that just does the DHCP without it. Yeah. Um, and they actually decided to integrate that too. Which I find particularly amazing given the fact that it's not actually public component yet, right? Like it's, uh, we don't come into a stable IPI for it yet. Um, we don't even export it yet. I mean, if you want to use it, you want to, as you can take the sources and uh, incorporate it into your code. So it's kind of cool that, that, uh, um, that all this is before we even saw a public making anybody interested in um, Okay, um, something uh, we have been working on in the last year, you know, which is going to come up in the rest of distributions, like it's a completely different topic now, is a unified and programmable hierarchy. I'm not sure if, if, like, I presume that not everybody in this room even knows what uh, control groups are supposed to be. Um, a little bit of background on that. Uh, there's very technical stuff. Um, it's basically, um, on Linux, um, you want to be able to uh, manage resources of the group process, uh, of processes in an efficient way. Like, for example, you have Apache in MySQL, it's called one machine. You want to make sure that uh, Apache gets this much, this much memory at most, um, and runs on CCPUs and gets this much CPU at most, and then you want to uh, set I.O. and things like that. And for, that's what you want to do for Apache, and then you want to do something different for MySQL, right? 
um, uniform, uh, like the control group stuff is something that uh, Sysb is very much based on. Basically, everything that Sysb manages is maintained in one of these control groups. Control groups are a kernel concept. It's exposed to user space in a, in a file system. Um, nothing weird in that. Um, um, yeah, control groups are horrible. Like they used to be at least. Um, it's uh, one of those kernel interfaces that we have had to build on for Sysb because they not only do this resource management for us, but they also do the the grouping, the general management of uh, um, service processes and service runtimes. Um, but they were horrible because they they were completely chaotic. Like people working on the various parts of resource management in it um, didn't always let's say cooperate the way they should have been, so they, they had very different semantics. Now, um, in, the, in, the, in the past year, so in the last three years or something, Tim Hill, my current guy, has been working on uh, fixing all that in the kernel. And uh, for that, to create something which is called the unified um, control group variety. The difference um, towards the old stuff being that uh, instead of having separate um, um, organizational trees, how these resources are man managed depending on the type of resource, right? So that you would have one tree for CPU management, one for CPU time management, one for um, IO management, uh, one for um, CPU binding management, and so on. He decided, okay, um, we'll just have one. Because after all, the operating system kind of wants to manage one variety, not many, and these varieties are not going to be um, independent, they're not going to be orthogonal anyway. So the result of the unified control uh, hierarchy, it's a very low level thing. You will get to contact it with you, uh, with it, uh, if, you if you are an administrator and then look at the details a little bit further, because it is actually exposed to various places in the operating system. Um, yeah, we adopted that necessity. Um, uh, like the old one um, since day one, the new one since last year. Um, it's going to be turned on in distribution very soon. Um, it will break six because uh, the unified control of variety is something you can you can choose if you want the old one or the new one, but you have to choose. And if you pick the new one, then the old software will not work. One of the old software that might not work is a pretty popular little program called Docker uh, because they uh, they uh, tend to directly access these devices. Anyway, I'm sorry short. Um, it's all going to be different, all, all going to be much, much better with the new with the unified control variety, but it's going to break out by the system. Um, at least uh, the programs actually, which actually interface with this. The net result of that is, um, for the first time, we get really clean notifications when the service actually uh, runs and ends. We get uh, um, fully integrated resource management on every level, right? Like we provide that already to some level of system so that you can add runtime, readjust the um, resource management of any service you run. But it's going to be much more complete and nicer. Yeah. And I talked. Uh, oh yeah. Well, one thing like along with the unified control group, group variety that we're going to do that is already in place, actually support for the PMEs control. This is a really basic thing, actually. It allows. You put a limit on the number of processes that a specific service can, can run, right? So you can basically say that Apache shall be able to run 200 processes, and MySQL shall be able to run 20 processes, so if they um, try to force some more, it will get an error. <coughs> Sounds absolutely basic, and it kind of is. Uh, it's kind of weird that it took up to 2015 to actually get this into the kernel. Yeah, another thing is that it's, um, the secret stuff is going to be safe for the first time for delegation. What does that mean? It basically means that, that even if you use these more complex things like resource controllers, you can delegate parts of the hierarchy to other software, like Docker, for example. Um, which is, yeah, kind of nice. Again, it's going to be an API track. If you ever looked at a Linux system on the secret hierarchy, you might have seen something like this before. Uh, like this before you have slash this and that secret with a controller name, and then you have the hierarchy. <coughs> First, basically, to a directory where you have all the processes in. And with the new stuff, it's going to look like this. It's going to be much simpler. The controller part is going to be removed. The controller part is usually like something like CPU, CPU set in memory. And that's kind of basically similar, but it's going to be different and going to break so. Anyway, I think I really talked way too much about control groups. I find it much more interesting, probably the most of you find it. Um, yeah, let's talk about something different. Um, System resolve fee. System resolve fee is a relatively recent addition. It's actually probably going to be the main part of the talk um, now. Um, what system resolve fee does? 
This is the DNS resolution. DNS resolution is pretty far across. Uh, well, my favorite first. Uh, which is, uh, of course, I mean, I'm going to feature pretty much everybody who knows what DNS is, right? right? It's a service on the internet that translates host names into IP addresses. Um, traditionally, on Linux, the way how DNS is implemented is that there's a library call in the GNC that uh, is called the Kedabra Info, a couple of alternatives for that stuff, but it's essentially all the same. We pass the host name and I will directly go to the network, talk to you about the DNS server, resolve to an IP address return. Um, that's pretty much like that, and uh, pretty limited. And uh, so as a result of the, we try to do the very same thing, but centralize it in a uh, first system service. So that the libraries, if they want to do a resolution, they don't do that directly, they go to the network and query that, but instead they would talk to a system result D. There are a couple of reasons why they should do that. First of all, it's the caching DNS result, right? Uh, meaning, uh, not every lookup you do actually goes to the network if you already passed this uh, 10 seconds before, right? Um, that's going to be minor benefit, but it's bad. Um, it also does a product called LLMNR. LLMNR is something with DNS, like Microsoft came up with that, basically about doing automatic name resolution in the local network. Um, yeah, the more interesting thing though is that it does DNS. <laughs> Uh, that's what I'm going to be very talk about this part. So the DNS stack is something um, where people want to um, uh, set it down uh, the name serves in the internet. Um, it's, a, it's, a uh, like it's a set of relatively old standards. Like uh, I've seen people started um, experimenting with that 10 years ago. Like that. In 2010, six, year, six years ago, um, the roots of like the DNS group that um, actually got signed to this DNSSEC for the first time. Um, the general goal of DNSSEC is to um, make sure that if you access www, um, I don't know, microsoft.com, then you actually end up at the microsoft.com IP address and not something else, right? Um, of course, in the case of microsoft.com, it's not a particularly interesting case, but it's certainly way more interesting if you think about your, if you do a lot of bank transfer, and you really want to be able to talk to the bank and not to something else that just pretends to be a bank and uh, collect the data. So, um, DNS is something to check it down that. It does not, um, it's authenticated DNS. It does integrity checks. Uh, and it does not do confidentiality. Meaning that uh, um, if you use DNS, and hopefully you will do that in the all, um, it will verify that uh, the data you get back, like the mapping from the host into the IP address, is actually what it claims to be, and this can be cryptographically verified. But it will not protect um, uh, things uh, regardless of confidentiality, meaning that um, uh, people will still be able to see that you did that in front, right? So um, people will not be able to fake the IP address of the bank if you want to access the bank, but they will be able um, to see that you have access the bank. So um, there's a change in trust. Basically, um, the root zone contains cryptographic tree, uh, keys that authenticate um, uh, the TLD zones. The TLDs, like the top-level domains, you know those. It's like .com, .net, and .de, and .be um, uh, uh, for the various countries. And, and, yeah, you know all those. Um, the TLD zones carry keys uh, which um, sign the domains below that, right? So that if you go to fatfossil.org, um, fossil.org is basically protected by the uh, keys that are stored in the org zone, and the, uh, the keys in the org zone are protected by the one in the root zone. And this goes recursively down, right? So if any name you have on the internet, you have to uh, find the keys in the, in the um, about that, so the signatures about that, and the others about that. So I don't really want to go too much detail on these that DNSSEC yeah, works with detail. Like, there are many talks about that, and um, I'm not a networks guy who really sits there and wants to talk about the detail. I want to know to talk about the implementation of this um, in DNS specifically. So, um, one of the use cases of DNS in particular is not just to do a host name to a um, uh, resolution, but also to carry a lot of additional information in DNS. Um, the guys behind DNS have mostly in mind embedding SSH, TLS, and P2P fingerprints, and other cryptographic um, uh, basic data. In the, in, the, in the DNS. The idea being basically that if you do uh, an open web browser connect to the bank, 
that um, the DNS will not only tell you talk to that IP address to so get the data from the bank, but it will also tell you, um, and by the way, the certificate, like the TLS certificate to you for the HTTPS connection that you're going to do, has this fingerprint. And then you don't need to authenticate the, the TLS certificate in any other way because you already know, because um, uh, you have this authenticated DNS scheme um, where basically you get the guarantee, yeah, cryptographically, I know, I may prove that this is actually really the fingerprint of that service. So it's, uh, in a way, it's a scheme how the variety of uh, certificate authorities on the internet, right, like we all know those, um, I figure like how they're eminent browsers, is actually unified with the variety of the DNS on the internet. Um, and yeah, that's the that's idea. Again, um, DNS is actually deployed around the world. It's deployed in the root zone. It's uh, deployed in most of the TLDs. Like .com, .net, .de, they all have it. Um, it was signed in 2016. It's also deployed by most US government websites. But other than that, too many people and uh, too many services are actually using it. There's an easier, like uh, you can go to that website and it will actually tell you the current statistics how of the, the world's most popular websites, how many actually use DNS. And interestingly, it's uh, 2%. I don't have that. Right? Facebook, Google, all these websites, they don't actually secure the, the, the stuff with the NSA. Which is interesting and which makes us wonder what happened in all those six years uh, since the, when the science was done. What's interesting to know, um, uh, Google runs the DNS server, the DNS server called 8888. Um, I think it's, I mean, it's, it kind of became popular, um, I think, even in the, in the normal press because uh, I don't know when, when, when Turkey blocked the internet for some websites, they did have a DNS um, information, and then um, they had the graffiti on the wall, so I hear the rest of that uh, Google DNS server. What's actually interesting about that Google DNS server is that they actually will validate that DNS server, right? So if you ask Google and you send your query to that DNS server instead of the one that your ISP usually provides you, then it will do the full DNS validation. You have some some chance that it has not been manipulated, which um, was the good thing about the it was it. Um, of course, it's also pretty useless, given that uh, uh, the communication between you and the DNS service is not necessarily in any way authenticated. Anyway, so um, regarding deployment, the websites are not very good at that. Um, the root zones and all these things are. Um, on the client side, right, on my user laptop that I use to access the internet, the NSF validation is pretty much non-existent. No OS implements it, right? Not Android, not generic Linux, not Windows, not Mac OS, nothing does. And that's interesting, right? Like, uh, how can that technology that has been adopted uh, by all the internet bodies, and uh, by the US government, and by um, all these things, has not been adopted at all? Um, yeah. So, why is it so often popular? So, the clients, they don't support it generally, as a message. And that's really important because it's really hard to write. It's like it's called cryptography and stuff, and uh, requires proofing things, and honestly, I think it's very complex. <coughs> Web browser vendors don't like it, right? Like, um, if you Google for it, they will find actually um, quite some um, harsh words, but I'm really love for example, about the NSA, I'm um, And it makes it slow, because uh, when you do a resolution of a hosting to an IP address, it's no longer sufficient to just send one query to the DNS server um, with the host and get the IP address back. You actually have to request the keys to authenticate this as, um, as well. So you actually do a set of requests and they are expensive. So um, whenever you go to the website, it will actually take a lot of time usually until it gets to that step where it actually makes it easy to connect to the HTTP server. So, yeah. On the server side, it's pretty nice to set up. Um, the, the, the way the protocol is designed is it's not automatic. It requires you to, to if you run a DNS server, you have to constantly keep it updated to, to resign things with, with new cryptographic keys. Regarding documentation, the specifications for it are quite frankly <coughs> not like, uh, um, like uh, I spend a lot of time in Copernicus, and um, the, the specs basically leave out all the really interesting part when it comes to the cryptographic proofs and what they're doing. So, yeah. And then there's the philosophical question. 
is actually a good idea to replace this um, uh, like pluralistic certification sorry, the system that we currently have, but you can get a um, uh, TLS certificate from quite a few parties. It would be really good to, to centralize it in one place, which is in ENS, which is this, uh, run by the IANA, which is like this international institution, which is effectively the US government. Um, it's actually it's, it's just a really good idea to replace one by the other. But actually, nobody really needs it, right? Um, it doesn't enable anyone to do anything he uh, wasn't able to do before, right? Coming back to this example with the with banking that I gave earlier, it's completely, you know, um, it's already we can authenticate that first part of the, where the host name is translated to the, to the IP address, but ultimately, um, that doesn't buy anybody anything because the actual authentication happens after that, right? And the HTTPS is, is relatively secure. I mean, it's, it's, it's old stuff, but it's, uh, ultimately the TLS stuff will authenticate um, uh, the fact that you're talking to the right server anyway. So um, if you do your banking transfer to an HTTPS server um, and do it via the NSSEC enabled transaction or without, it doesn't give you anything. Right? It will work the same way. So, yeah. So, after I told you basically um, how uh, not so awesome it is, I will still tell you that I recommend it for result view, and I think I read it. But, uh, I mean, it's, it's like, let's put it with IPv6, right? IPv6, since 16 years or something or, or longer, is like the next big thing that everybody will adopt. Still today, um, except for maybe the Wi-Fi here at Foster, pretty much nobody uses IPv6 on a normal computer, right? It hasn't been deployed on internal networks and then, uh, like telco networks and these kind of things, but on the wide internet it's pretty much non-existent, right? Um, until very recently, for example, on Google it had reached uh, on its normal URL um, on an IPv6 address. So, um, now for IPv6, there so are actually really good reasons to have it, right? Because there are no more IPv4 addresses um, available, so one would assume that it creates quite some pressure for a human to adopt it. The NSSEC doesn't have anything like that. Again, I'm pretty sure not too many people like to benefit from it because it doesn't fix anything. It's just, uh, I mean, it closes the gap, right? You can authenticate everybody, everything else on the internet, but you kind of uh, um, authenticate the NSSEC, so it would be good to authenticate that too. But ultimately, again, it doesn't buy anybody anything. Anyway, um, question, of course, um, when I was asking uh, yourself is, uh, should we actually support it? Right? Why it offer it? If none of the open house operating systems care, why should uh, this uh, Linux care? Why should this Linux care? Um, it's a good question. But uh, I would say because the data is there and because it actually is deployed in various zones. So, um, you know, security is not, a, is not something um, where you deploy one technology and then you, you, you want. Um, it's really something where you try to secure as much and have, uh, uh, that you can and you try to uh, secure the whole path. And then um, if one of those elements in the chain are weak, then you still have all the other elements that will help you. Um, so, yeah. We're very excited to actually implement that and actually make um, you know, something that's uh, happening. Of the clients because I mean, with the system we use, the, like, the focus that we really have with that is having some implementation that everybody really deploys, right? Um, which is, um, I mean, this is really the case for system B. What we want to do in system B is really about having things generic, right? We're not caring about a use case where you write something and run some three servers on the internet and maybe 100 servers on the internet. We really want something that can run on any Linux machine, like on pretty much anything by default um, that runs system B. And uh, to make it deployable by default, we have to make it proper. What is the uh, uh, private DNS servers, right? So um, I know like uh, many of you probably maintain their own DNS servers, and if they do that, they probably have their own private DNS servers. Like many, many companies here, like many big companies run their own private DNS servers. A private DNS server is basically that they came up with um, their own naming scheme that is completely different from the internet zone. Um, they um, establish it without registering it in the internet. Um, as long as you access this internal network of theirs, you can resolve all that stuff and see that though, if you use normal internet C, right? If you use DNSSEC, then all of that will break because um, suddenly everything that you do is cryptographically authenticated, it forms the top um, down, right? 
And meaning that if you have your own private uh, domain and call it foobar or something, and it doesn't exist in the real internet, then the real internet will tell you, I can prove you that foobar does not exist. And uh, then you cannot access the local zone. So if we want to make DNS like, employable for normal people, then we kind of really have to deal with that problem. And that is a big problem because uh, like common Wi-Fi routers actually do establish their own private DNS zones. Like in Germany, you have the Fritz box, which is a very, very popular commercial router. You can buy like everybody uh, who has these the, uh, a Wi-Fi router. There's a good chance you have one of those uh, Fritz box machines. All of them. Um, you can say that on private DNS zone, and the, the private DNS zone is called Fritzlock's box, right? And it looks like Fritzlock's box, of course, it looks like a, like a domain, but it's not about the internet right now. Now, the irony actually about this one is that uh, the top level domain dot box got recently sold to some consortium in Hong Kong. It's really fun, because uh, as soon as they offer uh, domains in that um, CLB, people can buy the domain, you can make everybody's uh, uh, the route configuration on success. We'll see how that works out. But um, it's kind of funny, but it's also, I don't know, it probably doesn't matter too much, but the key is these private DNS don't exist. And they probably exist in most ways how people access the internet, right? And it exists in many, many companies and it exists pretty much in every home in Germany. So um, just ignoring the fact that they exist. Uh, and saying, hey, hey, you can't configure your routers anymore, you can't access the uh, routers of the website anymore. It's really an, an option because the person says, yeah, we're breaking the internet for everybody because we don't care, because we think the NSA is more into it. But of course, we can't do that. So, um, uh, we're just going to resolve the when we decide, okay, we want to be an NSA and we actually want to make it something that can be deployed by default, we have to deal with the problem. We cannot take away the prior DNS. Right? We can up with a couple of um, uh, Strategies to deal with this. Uh, one of them being basically, uh, if you see the top box top level domain, name, um, and we make the proof that it doesn't exist, we commit it anyway, right? Um, we'll only do that for the top level domain, it's only for top box basically. Um, uh, we're not doing that for for domains below that. So it basically means that as long as the router invents a CLD that doesn't exist on the real internet, everything's fine. But what the router can, uh, what the router cannot do is invent a, 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 a domain below some other domain that already exists that is not a TLD. Like, for example, it's not supposed to define its own zone called foobar.rata.com because that would not be cool if you want to do an ex local extension of the, the public rat the right? So yeah, um, we also developed a couple of other strategies to deal with this kind of stuff, but it's really, it's a big issue. Like, if you want to prove that everything exists or not exists, and people have their own local stuff that doesn't exist in the real internet. <coughs> um, another really nice problem is the fact that DNS servers on the internet and routers are awful. <laughs> um, they generally don't uh, support DNS properly. The Google ones like the 888 that I mentioned is awesome. It does all these kind of things. It's, it verifies DNS internally. And if you want to talk DNS to it, right, we'll do that. But uh, routers generally don't do it. Right. The first box is actually um, a pretty good one. It actually allows you to talk DNSSEC, which is really weird in a way, because they also violate DNSSEC by providing their own domain. So they basically say, yes, I give you all the uh, possibilities to authenticate all the domains um, that you ask for me, but no, I will also fake a domain for you that you cannot prove to exist. So it's a bit weird. But um, most of the most of the DNS servers in other browsers are not way worse. Like one of the favorite test cases I have is like a, a, a Wi-Fi router that exists in my vicinity from a, a, a manufacturer at Belkin. Um, and, uh, it's so bad. Um, it's basically you ask me a question and uh, it says, it takes um, like two seconds and then it tells you, yeah, um, you can ask that. Um, and then it sends you back your own question again. But yeah, and not only the routers are crap, but also the ISPs are crap, right? In Germany, if you use um, Kongstar, which is the same thing as Deutsche Telekom, um, you get an, uh, a DNS server that doesn't do DNS, right? So um, if you if you if you customer of Telekom or Kongstar, um, then you can do DNS, um, which is kind of sad. And then there's a problem about captive portals. You know, captive portals are these things that if you, if you use the Wi-Fi at a, a hotel or an airport or something and go to URL and redirects you to some 
weird for private sign waves to send data and you pay or something like that. Those are captive portals. And the way many of them work, not all, is by faking DNS, right? So you type into your web browser www.fosten.org and it will um, actually um, give you back that result and pretend that it actually points somewhere else that it really does so that you go to that website and you get this uh, weird crappy captive portal um, page instead. Now, in a DNSSEC world, that's never going to work because DNSSEC, again, is about proving the authenticity of data. And if these captive portals fake the data, then there's nothing to authenticate. It will always say, yeah, the data is valid. So, um, it's a big problem. The way I see it is, um, like what we have in mind with, with uh, system being reloaded there is, well, um, Network Manager and Android on all these operating systems um, generally have code in there now that really tries to detect um, uh, captive faults. So what they do is, immediately when they got an IP address, they try to con uh, connect to uh, some well-known uh, website and uh, uh, check if something comes back that they expect uh, to come back, or if something else comes back. If something else comes back, they know that the traffic has been tampered with and uh, assume it's probably some kind of captive fault. This is deployed, like, like in, in, in Fedora, for example, if you use a network manager, it will always, like, whenever you set up a, 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 a network connection, you um, need to be connected to the Fedora service to see if it actually is connected to the real internet or some kind of also. Um, our strategy we got a captive calls on DNSSEC is, well, as long as we have this detection phase um, for DNSSEC, uh, for cat calls, we have to disable DNSSEC completely and put it everything. Which um, is not as bad as it sounds, I think. Uh, because the information, whether you have this captive protocol portal detection mode or if you're connected to real internet, is actually visible to the user in the network arc and, and you know, in the top right, like first, okay, this is weird. But this thing usually shows you, that looks very ugly. Uh, uh, so this thing in the top right usually shows you whether you're connected to the internet or not. And, uh, uh, and this, uh, if you are in a captive portal, it shows you some different icon. Anyway, so we have to deal with that kind of crap. <laughs> Um, so yeah, in system we try to resolve that because again, we want to create something that actually is deployable in everybody's machine. And if we do that, we have to make a couple of compromises. One of them is we have to downgrade from DNSSEC operation to non-DNSSEC operation aggressively, right? If we figure out for some reason we cannot do DNSSEC, we have to move it up. Which is uh, weird because uh, it opens everything up to a downgrade vulnerability. Right? If an attacker wants to um, uh, make you go to your banking site and pretend that you are at the real banking site but actually are the fake one, then you can do that by first making uh, your client downgrade to not the NSX mode and then faking any, uh, passing any data you like because then nothing is going anymore. Uh, that's a the problem. But then again, um, when we don't do this, um, you can't access the internet at all anymore um, if you have one of those DNS servers that uh, uh, support DNSSEC. And uh, you can't bypass these DNS servers and go all the way to 8888 because of those private zones again. Because the private zones, if I connect to the red um, uh, uh, internal network, for example, or some other internal network, or for example, my home network, um, then I really want to be able to resolve the local zones that are there. So if I would bypass the DNS servers, um, but I don't really find it always go to the internet one. Then I would see the internet, but I would certainly not see my own network So, yeah. And we thought the by default, when we turn this on, we will downgrade from DNSSEC mode to non DNSSEC mode automatically. Isn't that bad? It's kind of bad. Um, you can configure it also to not downgrade, but I think it's not, not everything lost. Like, first of all, it's a very elaborate checksum um, still, right? Because uh, if something by accident changed, we'll know. That's not too useful though. But uh, what I find more interesting is that it's the information whether um, things were authenticated or not is still propagated to the application, right? And if you come back to that use case that I mentioned earlier, where people want to to embed SSH, TLS, and PVD fingerprints um, in DNS, and things are still good because uh, um, the fact that something was authenticated or not is still passed to the application. And if you use SSH, for example, to connect to some server, like, like to the Git server of GitHub or something like that, and uh, you try to authenticate that the fingerprint of that DNS server actually matches uh, what's stored in the DNS, 
And you see that this DNS program that it did could not be authenticated, maybe because you were learning DNS instead of the DNS stack, then you will um, uh, uh, have to figure out a different way to authenticate it, right? Which is the traditional way, by, for example, by showing it to you on the screen and asking you, hey, can you verify that this actually matches what GitHub claims that uh, should be? So I think that's still useful, right? Like it's, it's, um, it's the only way I think how uh, DNSSEC can ever be made something that is deployable end to end on the internet, right? Because uh, um, if we wouldn't do it that way, we would always insist um, on doing DNSSEC. And basically means that at my home network, for example, I could not configure um, my browser anymore. At my parents' um, home network, I could not internet the, access the internet at all anymore because nothing would be solved because that would be nice server in that after that would do it. I couldn't use the internet at my girlfriend's um, home anymore because that DNS well is also crappy doesn't do it. And so on. I'd rather secure un access insecure internet than no internet at all. Anyway, so I talked a lot about the crap about um, uh, DNS like here. I know a lot of people actually love it. And uh, I got some more slides, and they're a bit random, but uh, I think um, uh, I talked about uh, most of the stuff that I want to talk about, which is the you NSAC. Know, um, hopefully, um, all that the you NSAC know, stuff will hit the distributions uh, very short, or very soon. And uh, um, uh, after some testing, a couple of disciples will hopefully um, have Linux and system to be the first ones to actually deploy the NSAC. In a while, it's um, on the client side. Um, uh, <coughs> but we'll see about that. Anyway, um, I think I've got eight minutes left or something. Um, uh, before I cut the other slides, I think uh, I'd rather do uh, QA here because I'm pretty sure that some people have uh, other questions than about the NSA or something. So, um, uh, can we continue playing with the, the microphone? So, um, yeah, if you have any questions about this, if you have anything, um, feel free to uh, stop. <coughs> Great on DNS screen, so I appreciate this. Um, I guess you've probably been following the work on DNS privacy on the ITF. I'm wondering if you have plans for uh, TLS encryption in uh, Resolver? TLS encryption? No, yeah. um, like, um, I don't know, I, 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 uh, I, the way I see it is it's DNS and it's not really about um, uh, privacy, it's really about security. Could the ones who leave be, be as quiet as possible? We still want to do the here. Um, please try to keep going. So, I don't have any plans to do the DLT as well. Okay. I mean, certainly that's that's the traditional DNS view, is that DNS is public. Um, certainly in, the, in, in recent years with, with pervasive internet monitoring, I think that, that common wisdom has been changed. And uh, there's a really good, you probably read at RFC about the the dangers of DNS and, and efforts to, to make it look right. So I, I, I know you've got a, taken on a big chunk of work here and probably aren't looking for more things to do. But if you've got a bucket list of things in the future, I would encourage you to at least consider uh, looking Honestly. at DNS privacy. Honestly, it would actually be super easy to add because I mean, we do support TCP transport for doing DNS queries. And if you do TCP, you can also do TLS. Um, it's, it's not that big of a difference. We also already bind to web providers anyway because we have to do authentication, right? Um, and it would actually be easy, but uh, um, the thing is like, um, at least none of my servers uh, support TLS based DNS. So um, I'm mostly interested in the generic case. It's kind of the, the motto of the entire system thing, right? That we always care about the generic case, we always care about the Making something that can be turned on by default. And I have my doubts that TLS based DNS lookup is something that is very commonly supported. So, anyway, another question. Okay, some time ago you wrote about um, that you want to change the way um, the base system and the limits um, and the packages are put together using containers. Um, Authorized um, done by system D. Is that still a thing? Are you working towards that? Is there a time frame? Uh, well, I mean, so, so basically, the basic operations and the, the, the components that we worked on kind of delivered already. The problem is that the distributions um, have not adopted that yet. And the reason for that is because uh, um, I didn't find the time to actually uh, push that. So. But uh, quite a few, so I mean, just a little bit of the background of this is uh, like uh, in the Disney uh, uh, context, we worked on making so 
persistent, uh, stateless uh, way. You basically can boot up the system by simply having slash user and nothing else around. Uh, so that the first time you boot it, it will automatically populate that scene slash bar uh, so that you have a complete uh, uh, system uh, to work with. Now, um, uh, Basically, if you, as long as you run a really basic system that just consists of system dealing with C and a couple of other really basic stuff, all that really works, right? I can um, uh, boot up my system easily with that user. You can populate it as you can have a password database, all that will be in place afterwards, all the missing things and such, run and such, marble and stuff, it's all good. But uh, that's absolutely not sufficient, right? In real life, uh, people don't run operating systems that basic, that put something on top of operating systems like Apache or MySQL or whatever else they want to run on it. And those generally um, don't support that mode, right? Because it, it means that people will have to buy a philosophy that services um, shall be uh, bootable without having any data in such Etsy and then fall back to default. And now, uh, first of all, nobody bothered with Apache to them the questions. And um, secondly, it also means that the philosophy about allowing to stay the system would be something that the, that the various service authors actually have to buy into. So it's, it's not just a tech question or something of, of, of work, but it's also about convincing the people that this is actually goes. And so far, I, uh, we didn't follow up that. But we have so much other things to come. But uh, I would absolutely welcome it. And I know that some distributions do have, um, if, if they would love that, um, at least uh, take part of it. Like, uh, like, for example, uh, the Red and Atomic Project uses some parts of it, uh, all of the content that we created there. Uh, I don't think that if, the, if this would be on the, the big scale, but it's really much of what's left now to do to actually take that reality. It's not so much something that we can do, it's something that the distributions have to figure out, if they actually want this, and I think they should, but they have to do work. Um, and there's the really third party services actually on the uh, I think we have two minutes left, so... Well, Sorry. So where does the crypto in systemd come from? Sorry? Where does the crypto come from within systemd? The crypto? We use uh, the Jupyter. Okay, perfect. And uh, are you also using GDC then? Uh, are you what? Obsoleting GDC. Are you working towards uh, getting rid of GDC as your... Uh, no. ...in the resolution? No. Like, we don't understand it, like, we just do VNS stuff. Like, what's up? Like, I don't know if you can argue the way that the question is why you see evidence about these kind of DNS resolutions. But no. Like, the system uses Ellipse APIs like crazy. We, we don't uh, um, focus on the strategic and context APIs or, 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 or simply actively use the DNS extensions <laughs> and Ellipse uh, extensions. But sometimes I can find it. Can I see one last question? Anybody have one?